Okay. As soon as you have the georeferencing folder, you what you'll find in it are three subfolders and then a series of numbered presentations or other resources and a couple of documents. For today, we're going to be going through each of the numbered presentations or other resources. Some of them are JPEGs, for example, in order. And the other folders, one is for the georeferencing calculator. Please don't run the georeferencing calculator yet. I want to make sure that we do something before you run the georeferencing calculator. And the other two are materials that will be of interest to you. Sources may be empty. Let me check that. It is. Uh, so never mind that folder. You don't need to have anything in it. Additional materials contains other PowerPoint presentations and uh, documents that were used in other georeferencing courses for material that we cannot cover here today. So here is an overview of what today's agenda will look like. I'll give sort of a brief introduction to what we're doing and then I'll follow it by all of those numbered presentations and the last thing will be an exercise using the georeferencing calculator in the afternoon. So the first thing I want to do is to switch over to a, an agenda to show you the reason why we won't be covering all the materials that are in the additional materials folder in the georeferencing folder. The reason for that is that normally georeferencing is a five-day workshop. This is Monday through Friday, starting at 8.30 in the morning and going until 5.30 at night with a combination of talks and exercises. So you're only getting the briefest of introductions. So I want you to realize that when you walk away from here, you will not be georeferencing experts. You will not be given the certificate of uh, knowledge, full knowledge of georeferencing. What you will have is a good introduction up through the use of one of the primary tools for georeferencing, which is that georeferencing calculator. What you will be missing are a series of um, presentations and exercises for online resources. These are things like how to use Google Maps and Google Earth, various gazetteers, to be able to find place names and their coordinates, all kinds of different things that are actually online to help you georeference. You'll entirely miss all of the paper map exercises. Normally what we do is we bring these giant maps, usually in the host, a map of somewhere in the host country, and we have exercises to do georeferencing directly from those maps. We'll have a small exercise with maps, but it's not anything like this. You'll also entirely miss GPS exercises. Usually we have some kind of a game where all of us go out in groups, each group with a GPS, to try and understand some of the implications of the use of a GPS. Not just how to use it, but how to use it right. There is a wrong way to use a GPS. You'll see what that wrong way is, but we won't actually see it in practice outside. Finally, there are a whole two days normally on semi-automated automated, georeferencing with associated exercises. And one of those full days is on the use of geolocate. So realize that here you won't get any introduction whatsoever to geolocate. I will describe what it is, however. I wanted to make note also that uh, there is a new website in production right now. It's not complete yet, but the intention is that it will be the primary resource for all of the materials that you see here and connections to training courses that already exist and so on. And that site is georeferencing.org. Finally, um, we have on the georeferencing folder, 
buried deep in a place that I will tell you when the time comes, a georeferencing quick reference guide for which we also have printed materials. So when the time comes, I'll hand out the printed materials for that as well. This is quite useful to have in hand when you're georeferencing, so that's why we went to the trouble for this one to actually print it. So that's a quick outline of what we'll do. I will go right into what is georeferencing now. And now I have technology. So maybe I don't have to run back and forth as much as in the other days. Okay. What I'll cover are two fundamental questions. What is a georeference and why should we do it? What I've come up with is something of the most simple and succinct description of what a georeference is. And I would say that it's a numerical description of a place that can be mapped. It's a somewhat simplistic description, but it, the idea is that what we have usually is something like this. We begin with biodiversity records that have some kind of identifier on them, like a catalog number, some species, and descriptive localities. They're actually writing in plain native language where something was. This is common. This is what you find on labels. The locality information when we're sharing data can be found in all of the locality related terms, including all of the higher geography ones like water body, island, and island group for marine or aquatic environments, plus all the administrative boundary type of information, continent, country, country code, state, province, county, and municipality. And then we get into the specific localities. So this is the information that allows us to get quite specific about where the collection or observation occurred. So locality is quite important. And then we usually have additional information associated with it, or sometimes have it, maybe not usually, and that's associated with the elevation. That's what we had. What we really want is the ability to put these things on maps. We don't have a way to automatically take a descriptive locality and put that on a map. We have to do some work. We have to provide some coordinates. The coordinates are what are needed to put dots on maps. But I'd like to convince you that we need to do more than just put dots on maps. And that's what georeferencing will be all about, not just latitudes and longitudes. So the information that we get from the process of georeferencing is going to go into a whole set of different Darwin core terms called the georeference terms. And you'll notice that although, yes, we do have a latitude and longitude set of coordinates, we have many, many, many other fields in which to describe the georeference. I'll try to convince you of the value of using all of these. But basically, we need something called a geodetic datum, and I'll tell you what that is. And we need some measure of an uncertainty of the entirety of this determination. We call it a coordinate uncertainty in meters. It's a linear distance. Then we have information about who did the georeferencing and what rules did they follow. And then what sources did they use, be it maps or online resources. Then there's something interesting called the georeference verification status. That is a way to tell the user of these data how much effort has gone into this. Georeferencing verification status consists of one of three values. There are three legal values for that term in theory. One is unverified. We have a georeference, but we can't say anything about how good it is. The second next value, best value is georeferenced, or sorry, verified by the curator, which means the curator has gone to the effort to say that the georeference as provided is as good as the curator can produce. They can't get it any better than that. They have 
looked at all the materials. They have put it on a map and they have checked that the georeference is as good as it can be. So what's better than that? There's one other category better than that and that is verified by the collector. So the collector was the one who was there. If the collector sees the georeference on a map and say, says that that's as good as it can be, then that's as good as the georeference can ever be. Now why would we go to the trouble of putting a verification status on a georeference? The reason is that at times a georeference produces a point for a specimen that seems strange for some reason. For example, it might be a georeference that puts the species outside of its usual accepted range. But if the collector really found it there, and the verification status says so, then the user of the information no longer has to write to the museum and say, what's wrong with this? It's not in the right place. Because it is in the right place. That's already been checked. The effort has already been made to determine that it's in the right place. And so you don't have to bother the curator anymore. You don't have to bother the collector anymore. That work's already been done. I spent a lot of energy in describing this one term. It's because it won't come up again throughout the rest of the presentations. So I wanted to make that one understood. And finally, there are general remarks about the georeference that say something about assumptions that were made that are out of the norm for the protocol used. Sometimes you have to make a choice and it's best to say so and that's where georeferencing marks come in. So, I said that this is what a georeference is, but I've also told you that a decimal latitude and a decimal longitude is insufficient. It's not a good georeference. It allows you to put dots on maps. But basically it is only gives you this point method in which you have a dot on the map. I think this is skipping. Let me check one moment. I'm going back. Don't worry. Okay. It's not skipping. I changed the order of my long time presentation. I wanted to say something about a quality of a georeference and data quality in general. And that is this series of bullet points. Throughout the history of the data, they will have the potential to be used in ways that you do not anticipate. Science will evolve and your data will be useful in other contexts than those in which you expect in which you gathered them. You have to keep that in mind when you talk about museum time. The value of those data will be directly related to how fit they are for a particular use. So you can imagine that if there are uses that you don't imagine right now, the best you can do is to be as complete and correct as you can when you do a georeference. So Arthur Chapman quotes, as data become more accessible, many more uses will become apparent. That is, data will be used in other ways. And finally, I want to make note that there's an, uh, an entire document that is on your, in your georeferencing folder called the GBIF Best Practices Guide to Georeferencing. And this is basically a book. It's almost 100 pages long on all of the theory and all the practice behind what we'll learn today about how to georeference and why. So that gets us to wanting to do better than just that point method, more than just dots on maps. And then I would redefine our definition. I would say that a high quality georeference is a numerical description that can be mapped, but that describes the spatial extent of the locality and all of its associated uncertainties. I, go, I can go ahead and describe a little bit about what I mean before I get to the pictures that describe what I mean. What we want is, if you imagine a, any kind of measurement, say temperature, and you're doing a, a rigorous experiment, 
If you record the temperature, that's one thing, but it might be very, the, your experiment might be very dependent on the temperature. And so what you want is not only the temperature, but a measure of its uncertainty. It's that temperature plus or minus some value based on your, your ability to measure it. 